Ja, nur leider haben offensichtlich viele andere Parteien Unfortunately, many other parties and politicians have obviously completely lost a fundamental characteristic of our basic law, namely the peace mandate that is enshrined in our constitution. This peace mandate emerged after World War II primarily because Germany was meant to be a peace power. Germany was supposed to be perceived worldwide as a peace actor. War should never again emanate from German soil, and war weapon exports should never again come from German soil, with which wars and human rights violations are committed, as is currently the case in Gaza by Israel, also with the help of German arms exports. All this actually mandates being neutral and advocating for an independent, sovereign foreign and security policy based on the interests of democratic sovereignty and the majority of the population and not of any corporations or the military-industrial complex. Hello, zusammen. Hier bin ich wieder mal in deutscher Sprache. Hello, everyone. Here I am once again speaking in German, because today I have the great pleasure and honor of speaking with one of Germany's most famous and powerful parliamentarians. I have with me Miss Sevim Dardelen, who has represented her constituency of North Rhine-Westphalia in the Bundestag since 2005, formerly for the party Die Linke, and for the past few months for the newly founded party Bündnis Sarah Wagenknecht. Incidentally, Miss Dardelen is also the spokesperson for foreign policy for the new party. Recently, Ms. Dardelen also released a great book titled NATO, A Reckoning with the Alliance of Values. You can imagine how much joy this reading has brought me. Today we want to talk about her critique and analysis of NATO. Ms. Dardelen, welcome to Neutrality Studies. Frau Dardelen, herzlich willkommen auf Neutrality Studies. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Nun, Frau Dardelen, Sie schreiben wunderschön. Well, Ms. Dardelen, you beautifully write at the end of your book that the pursuit of alternatives to NATO is resistance against a world war policy. We need peace instead of NATO. Why did you write this NATO critical book now, and could you briefly present the main theses of the book? Die Hauptthesen des Buches vorstellen. Yes, very gladly. So why I wrote it? We are witnessing a NATO that seems to be at the peak of its power, namely on its 75th anniversary. It relies on escalation when you analyze what NATO is doing. Keyword, proxy war against Russia in Ukraine, complicity with Israel in this murderous war in the Gaza Strip against the Palestinian population, or the expansion towards Asia with a global claim to power, far removed from a territorial restriction to the North Atlantic area. And we must acknowledge that this NATO, which was completely renewed after the Cold War, is dangerous and is pushing us to the brink of a third world war like never before. We can also see this in the current debates. For this policy of escalation and expansion, NATO needs myths, legends, and fairy tales. The great myths of NATO are that it is a defensive alliance, an alliance of democracies and rule of law, and an alliance for the respect of human rights and values. And I believe that the prerequisite for seeing reality is to deal with these myths, to put the myths to the test. This is the prerequisite for having a realistic view of the military pact, which is nothing more than a war pact. Consequently, we must initiate the urgent discussion. What do we need instead? We need peace instead of NATO. How can we establish peace and common security in the world? This book is intended to serve that purpose. It offers a realistic assessment and analysis of NATO. Why was it founded? What are the big myths? What drives NATO? And then, of course, the leap to Asia, the expansion of NATO, and finally the outlook. Und ähm, dann zum Ausblick zu kommen. Die NATO expandiert ja ständig, aber einen Ort an dem NATO is constantly expanding, but one place it hasn't expanded is Russia. We know that Russia has knocked more than once and asked if it could join when the Cold War ended. How do you explain that NATO seems to constantly need an enemy? Konstant einen Feind zu brauchen scheint. 
Und man muss uh, einfach mal in die uh, Gründung der NATO schauen. Die NATO And one simply has to look at the founding of NATO. NATO was founded in 1949 by 12 states, led by the USA. The predecessor of this North Atlantic Treaty was the OAS Treaty, the Treaty of the Organization of American States. From the very beginning, especially during the founding phase, during the period a period of systemic confrontation with the Soviet Union, it was essentially always about establishing a Pax Americana, that is, creating an exclusive sphere of influence for the USA. This actually stands in contradiction to Russia as the successor state of the Soviet Union. After the end of the Cold War, the European states, together with Canada and the USA, contractually committed themselves in the Charter of Paris to establish a common peace and security order a common, comprehensive, and inclusive house in Europe. Integratives gemeinsames Haus in Europa zu gründen, uh, aber statt diese gemeinsame Friedens- und Sicherheitsordnung zu gründen. But instead of establishing this common peace and security order, further confrontations and escalations were provoked. Contrary to promises not to expand an inch, not a centimeter to the east, the military alliance has advanced its expansion to the borders of Russia. Today, NATO, as in 1949, serves as an instrument of the unchallenged leading power, the USA, to enforce, pursue, promote, and safeguard its strategic and security interests. That was the intention from the beginning. I'm talking about Pax Americana, an exclusive sphere of influence of the USA. It remains so to this day, and NATO is still intended to serve to maintain the USA as the world hegemon. Therefore, deterrence, armament, and confrontation are relied upon, setzt man auf Abschreckung, auf Aufrüstung und Konfrontation. Wer so argumentiert wie Sie, und ich argumentiere genau gleich, Anyone who argues like you, and I argue the same way, is usually accused of being Putin puppets, pro-Russian, or bought and paid for, and that we are getting money for it. How do you explain this narrative? Especially in Germany, it is extremely strong. Is it really, as Mr. Stoltenberg once said, that weapons are the way to peace? and no one notices that this is madness. Why do so few people in Germany notice this? Wieso fällt das in Deutschland so wenigen Leuten auf? Ja, dazu gehe ich ja auch ein in meinem Buch, nämlich in einem Kapitel. Yes, I also address this in my book, particularly in a chapter about disinformation and NATO's cognitive warfare. It's about how NATO aims to win wars not only on the battlefield, but also in people's minds. Propaganda plays an important role in this. If you talk to a three- or four-year-old child, they will logically respond that weapons do not bring peace. Weapons lead to more death, more destruction, and fewer wars. Töten zur Förderung, zur Befeuerung eines Krieges, und das ist das Gegenteil von Frieden ist. Und das ist aber... And that is the opposite of peace. Therefore, it is all the more necessary to conduct propaganda that explains to people that war is the same as peace, and that weapons are diplomatic peace tools, instead of saying that they are murder tools. We know this. Like in a totalitarian state, the opposition is fought by the mainstream media by suspecting them of collaborating with the enemy. There are many journalists in Germany who now label anyone who is even remotely against sending weapons into an ongoing war and instead advocates for negotiations as Putin friends, Kremlin agents, or similar. Putin Freunde, Kreml Agenten oder sonstiges hinzustellen, Und, um, ich finde, das ist durchsichtig, eine sehr, uh, and I think this is very transparent propaganda. That this is always a part of war propaganda is known from the 1920s and 1930s of the last century. Back then, people who opposed the First World War were also defamed. It was about countering the supposed social democratic left narrative. They claimed that one had to stand up against the barbarism of Tsarism in Russia. Today, the Russian president is equated with Hitler to silence or denounce any criticism. We really know this from history, and one should not be intimidated by it. It is clear that these parties and partly the mainstream press are pushing for another war, for an escalation, for direct German involvement in the war against Russia. And we should not let this drive us crazy. We will be proven right, just as we were, for example, for 20 years in the war against Afghanistan. When the war against Afghanistan started, there was again a barrage of propaganda, 
of war propaganda. It was about the barbarity of the Taliban. It was about building wells. It was about sending girls back to school. It was about defending Germany's security and freedom in the Hindu Kush. And when we said over 20 years ago that this war was wrong, we were proven right. You cannot win a war against terror. You cannot win a war against terror. It is completely absurd and contemptible to want to export democracy to other countries against the will of the population. They have made us contemptible by claiming that we would side with the Taliban and are not humanitarians. They say we are against humanitarian interventions. I think one should really not be intimidated. Peace still means the absence of war, weapons, and instruments of murder. Wars are promoted by arms exports and arms deliveries, not by diplomatic negotiations, which we advocate. In this respect, we should not be deterred, but insist that we want to create peace without weapons. How did you personally manage not to get drawn into this vortex? We have seen it with the Greens and the SPD, who were actually once against NATO. Today, I slowly get the feeling that the greenest thing about the Greens is still the color of the uniform. But even that has become quite dark, olive green. How is it with you? You were first with the left and are now with the alliance Sarah Wagenknecht. How many people in the Bundestag are against this war policy of the majority? Well, one must say from the party's perspective, there is only the Sarah Wagenknecht alliance that is consistently against this toxic mix of arms deliveries and economic warfare through sanctions. It advocates for an unconditional ceasefire, whether in Gaza or in Ukraine, and for negotiations, compromise solutions, and diplomatic solutions. We are truly the only ones in this regard because it also goes hand in hand with social cutbacks. So the entire rearmament policy and the proxy wars of NATO primarily serve to enforce the interests of the USA. One could use the term client states from the Roman Empire, which fight these wars for the USA. These wars are, of course, also directed inward and are accompanied by massive cuts in the social sector. I would like to mention another example besides Germany, Italy. There, there was a real wage loss of 3.6 to 3.8 percent in the years 2022 and 2023 by 2.1 percent. Unemployed individuals, single unemployed individuals, and young people up to the age of 59 have now experienced cuts in social assistance there. Beispielsweise wurde ihnen jetzt äh, die Sozialhilfe gekürzt. Sie bekommen nur noch äh, rund 250. Äh, ähm, you only receive around 250 or 350 euros instead of 780 euros, and that only for 12 months. The entire rearmament policy in Europe is financed with war credits. This results in budget deficits that are tackled with cuts in the social sector, the health sector, and the education sector, just like in Germany. The only alliance against this toxic mix is Sarah Wagenknecht's. We have the AFD on the right side of the arena, presenting itself as a peace party. But the AFD is not against rearmament, quite the opposite. The AFD is a party for militarism and for capital. You support the 100 billion euro special debt for the Bundeswehr and have said that it is even too little for you it could be significantly more. You support that Germany last year allocated 90 billion euros for armament and military, over 2% of the gross domestic product, and actually wants to spend even more. You support NATO as a military alliance. You also supported in the vote that, that NATO was expanded to include Sweden and Finland, which I consider a fatal mistake, the northern expansion as well as the eastern expansion before that. The AFD supported this and, unlike us, is not only not against rearmament and militarization, but also has no problems with social cuts. She is against a statutory minimum wage, the increase of the minimum wage, and social housing construction. However, 
there are here and there members of parliament in various factions, be it the CDU-CSU faction or the SPD, who recognize this madness. But they usually do not dare to publicly stand against it, against the faction line or the party line, which I find very regrettable. We need every voice against the war and against Germany's or NATO's direct involvement in this proxy war in Ukraine, which holds enormous escalation potential. And we will talk about that in a moment. But I would like to return to something you mentioned in the conclusion of your book, which pleases me the most, also in relation to the name of my channel. You write that Europe must return to diplomacy and international law, and most importantly, have the courage to embrace neutrality. Could you elaborate on that? How do you see neutrality as part of Europe's future? Neutralität als ein Teil der Zukunft Europas. One might first need to say that members of NATO engage in a trade-off. As soon as one becomes a member of this military pact, one loses independent autonomy and also sovereignty. This applies both to foreign and security policy as well as to domestic policy because they are naturally intertwined. One essentially gives up neutrality. And I believe that this means conversely that we need to leave this military pact in order to be neutral, autonomous, and independent again, and to regain sovereignty in our politics, whether domestically or in foreign policy. And I believe that NATO members are at risk of subordinating their foreign and security policy to the directives of Washington and giving up their own democratic sovereignty. This is evident right now, for example, because U.S. President Biden declared overnight that Western weapons, especially American weapons, can be used in Ukraine for war objectives in Russia. Shortly thereafter, Chancellor Olaf Scholz said that German weapons can now also be used. So, if one still needs proof that we are essentially just a vassal state of the USA and almost instantaneously follow every step of the US administration, then we have received this proof once again today. This is, of course, dangerous for us. Therefore, I say we need an independent Europe of sovereign democracies in a multipolar world. This includes an independent European foreign and security policy that is oriented towards good relations with the major powers. It must also take into account international law, detente policy, and balancing of interests. This requires stopping the expansion of NATO into Asia and Europe. Of course, one should simultaneously pursue a policy of disengagement, as George F. Kennan, for example, advocated. Kennan was a significant foreign policy figure in the USA. The goal is to achieve a disentanglement of military blocs and to launch a diplomatic initiative to reduce the risk of direct military confrontation. This is all important. In the past, it has been observed that countries adopting a neutral position are protected from attacks. They are not perceived as aggressive states that might attack, and therefore do not run the risk of being preemptively attacked. And this neutrality has protected many countries, such as Switzerland for 200 years, or Ireland, but this neutrality is naturally under pressure. The neutrality of Finland and also Austria has protected them as well. Both countries have historically benefited from this neutrality, such as the withdrawal of Allied and Russian troops from Austria. In Finland, this neutrality has also protected the country. I believe it is a mistake to think that Ireland can achieve more security by joining a military pact. I absolutely agree with you. Often the counter-argument is made that Belgium was invaded and neutrality does not work. Then I always have to say, yes, but the other allied states in the First World War also ended up in the war. Ultimately, alliances have an extreme potential to generate war. 
If you had a majority in the Bundestag tomorrow for an alliance with Sarah Wagenknecht and you were Chancellor, would you take Germany out of NATO and declare it neutral? Well, I would of course wish for a federal republic of Germany that remains neutral. We recently celebrated the 75th anniversary of our Great Basic Law on May 23rd. Unfortunately, many other parties and politicians have completely lost a fundamental characteristic of our Basic Law, namely the peace mandate that is enshrined in our Basic Law. This peace mandate emerged after the Second World War because Germany was supposed to be a peace power. It was therefore supposed to be perceived worldwide as a peace actor. War should never again emanate from German soil. And from German soil, there should never again be exports of war weapons with which wars and human rights violations are committed as is currently the case in Gaza by Israel with the help of German arms exports. All this actually demands that we remain neutral and advocate for an independent, sovereign foreign and security policy based on the interests of democratic sovereignty and the majority of the population now, and not of any corporations or the military-industrial complex, whether in Germany or the USA. That is what I would wish for. But it would, of course, be illusory to say that such ideals could be achieved immediately tomorrow. Therefore, concrete steps must be taken. We are taking these concrete steps by relying on diplomacy, both in Gaza and in Ukraine. We need an unconditional ceasefire. The dying must be stopped and the risk of escalation must be reduced. The second point is that we want to return to international law. NATO is not an alliance that has respected international law so far. On the contrary, it leaves a trail of blood in NATO's history. Violations of international law, illegal wars, and war crimes characterize NATO. Yes, exactly. That's why I mean these myths. 25 years ago, with the war of aggression against Yugoslavia, it was proven that television stations and infrastructure were bombed. Even the Chinese embassy in Belgrade was bombed by NATO. There was no international legal authorization for these bombs. Twenty years of war in Afghanistan were conducted with numerous war crimes that remain unpunished to this day. The leading power of NATO, the USA, waged an illegal war against Iraq with the help of other allied NATO states and NATO infrastructure. Even countries like the Federal Republic of Germany, which did not actively participate in this war, provided NATO infrastructure on German soil and thus effectively supported it. And of course, there is the war in Libya in 2011, also the attack on Libya in disregard or misuse of a UN resolution for a regime change war by NATO. We have seen all of this, and it is not a defense alliance. According to the American Brown University, the NATO leading power USA is responsible for the death of 4.5 million people in the last 20 years in this war on terror. If one wants to end this, one must of course return to international law. All states must adhere to this if they do not want to wake up in anarchy or barbarism. That is the alternative to international law, to an international order that everyone must follow. And we need arms control treaties again. We must return to disarmament. It is absurd and extremely dangerous to live in a world where there are weapon systems that can destroy the entire planet multiple times and where there are no longer any arms control agreements that are adhered to and mutually respected. We need to return to that. And what we also need, of course, is an end to economic wars and unilateral sanctions. These sanctions are primarily decided unilaterally and in violation of international law by the West. Normally, under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, the UN Security Council alone is authorized to impose sanctions. But the West, the EU and NATO simply decide on sanctions for themselves, or the USA decides on them. 
These sanctions are considered the weapons of mass destruction of our time. Thousands of people in Cuba, Venezuela, and Syria suffer from these unilateral sanctions. Not to mention the economic wars that bring us to the brink of economic collapse, even in the industrial nations of Europe. For example, the sanctions against Russia, this economic war, or now the economic war against China, which is particularly instigated by the USA. 100% tariffs on electric cars, 50% on semiconductors and solar cells, 25% on batteries and port cranes. On solar cells, 25% of batteries and hafen cranes. With these latest announcements, the US administration from Biden verschärft sich die. With these latest announcements from the Biden administration, this trade war between the USA and China is intensifying. This leads to Germany getting caught in the crossfire, especially considering that China is our largest trading partner. We need to return to regulations in arms control and to cooperation in economic relations. We should move away from the escalation of economic relations with Russia and China and return to international law and diplomacy. These would be essential steps to de-escalate the situation worldwide and achieve a relaxation of tensions. I hope that when we celebrate the 75th anniversary of NATO this year, we won't have a 76th or 80th anniversary. Dieses Jahr 75. Jahrestag der NATO erleben, dass es keinen 76. oder 80. gibt.